implicit differentiation, this is something you'll also have to do. So implicit differentiation is essentially when we try to differentiate the y as well as the x simultaneously because sometimes you can't break them apart. So you can't really make one thing the subject and the other thing, like it's kind of like x squared plus y squared equals to 2. I feel like that's really like x squared plus y squared equals to a or something like that's a really common example because you could rearrange for y but you would get plus or minus so it just makes everything a little bit more awkward and implicit differentiation is actually relatively straightforward and it's a better way to go around it so what you do is you just differentiate everything as if y was the variable and then after you do that you just chuck a dy dx after every y that you differentiate importantly if you oh, if you differentiate something which is like x y squared right really importantly when you try and differentiate something like that you must 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 only add the dy dx when you actually differentiate the y component so if we tried to diff something like that the first part would be one right y squared and then plus two y x dy dx so see how the dy dx only goes with the part when I actually differentiate the y rather than this part. Because in this part, the y is kind of like, the y squared is just a inert type thing. It's not really participating in this process, but compared to this one where it's actually being differentiated. Cool. All right, so let's talk a bit about related rates as well. It's often an application-y type of question that comes up not uncommonly and gets even worse when we do differential equations. So what we want to do is make sure we know the information in the question, particularly units are really important in any type of application question. Um, and you can also talk about the direction of the gradient as well. So then you want to want to say to yourselves, so how I like to think of it is what do I have? So this is what do I have? What do I want? And what am I missing? Right, so what do I have? What do I want? What am I missing? And then I find what I'm missing, right? So I answer this question, and then that gives me what I want from an equation, and then I can kind of answer it in however many units I want. So those are my three questions. What do I have? What do I want? And what am I missing to get what I want, essentially? Um, and you can write out the formula and then substitute the answers as appropriate. Okay, so in terms of parametric differentiation, it's literally the same as related rates. It's just the dy, like it's it's just chain rule. So d, dy dx will equal to dy dt times dt dx. It's a bit of a dodgy math, but essentially if you look at the denominator and the numerator and try to work those out together, if they cross out, then they are cancelled out and you can kind of combine the two together. It's a bit of dodgy math though. Definitely don't actually draw lines through them. Just write it out. And if you can see it, then it should cancel out. Alrighty, so let's go through this question together. Water is draining from a cone-shaped funnel at a constant rate of 600 centimetres cube per minute. Um, the cone has a height of 50 and a radius of 10. Let H be the depth of the water in the funnel at time t. The rate of decrease of H in centimetres is given by. So the first thing, that was a lot of, lot of information, right? We don't really care what's, what's happening. So we know that it's draining from the funnel. So we know that it should be negative, right? So right away, we know that dv dt is going to equal to negative 600. So that's the information we can glean from there. It has a height of 50 and a radius of 10. Okay. H be the depth of water in the funnel at any time. So this is H. Oh, sorry. That's h, right? And we want the rate of decrease of h, right? So we want dh dt. So this is what we have. This is what we want. And if we write out an equation, so dh dt is going to be equivalent to dh dv times dv dt, right? So what we're missing is dh dv. Now, how can we get dh dv? So what's the relationship between the height and the volume of a cone? We know that the height and the volume of a cone, we get that V will equal to one third pi R squared H. 
it's also really useful to have all of the equations and stuff kind of combined into your to make sure you have like geometric equations so stuff for cones circles spheres and 2d shapes as well in your bound reference because so it's particularly special it uses a lot of shapes um and like throughout their content so in calculus vectors complex numbers just doing basic linear stuff as well lots of shapes and all of their proofs involve shapes as well so it's really useful to have that basis and because you learn the cosine and the sine rule in one two they kind of use that as implied knowledge so it's important for you to have those formulas and stuff in your bound reference because it sometimes does make your life a little bit easier cool so what we can tell from there is we have, we're missing an R variable and once you do this once you'll probably never forget it. So what you use is simultaneous equation, sorry, similar triangles. So we know that this is 50 and this is 10. We also know this is R and this is H. So why these are similar is because they share an angle right down there, share this angle, share this angle and share this angle, right? Because these two lines are parallel. So they share all of those angles in there so therefore they're similar right so therefore what we can do from there is say h over r will equal to 50 over 10 so therefore you'll get that h will equal to 5r so what we can get from there therefore is that we can sub that back in so we'll get this is one third pi 5r times r squared so we'll get this is going to be 5 on 3 pi r cubed. Okay, so that's what v... Oopsies, we put it in the wrong one, didn't we? Let's rewrite that again. Got too excited, made everything in terms of r. So we need everything in terms of h because we're trying to find h, aren't we? So we need to find what d... We need... In order to find d, dh, dv, we need actually in terms of h rather than in terms of v. I mean in terms of r so we can actually find it. So therefore r over h will be equal to 10 over 50. So r will equal to 1 fifth h. So therefore when we have this, we'll have this as third pi 1 fifth h squared times h. So what we'll get from there is v will be equivalent to 1 over 75 pi h cubed so what we want is dh dv so we need dv dh first which will give us 1 over 25 pi h squared and then when we put that back into here it will now just be 25 over pi h squared times by so that will be our dh dv now if we want our dh dt now it's going to just be 25 over pi h squared times my negative 600 so it will be negative 600 so 6 6 times my 25 would be 150 right and because we're looking for the rate of decrease so we're looking for the rate of decrease so that's 150 150 and then 0 0 so really the only answer which is looking Apito like appetizing is that one there and we can see that the pi h pi over h squared is at the bottom so that looks good these don't involve anything so right away you can probably rule out the other options but it's a rate of a decrease that's why the negative is gone okay have a drink of water Let's move on to second derivatives. So second derivatives are also quite useful. All we have to do is just literally differentiate another time and it tells you how much the gradient is increasing or decreasing. So it's useful to find out where like if the turning points are maximums or minimums because that kind of tells you or if there's stationary points of inflection. Um, basically if you have a double derivative e clean to zero what that actually tells you is that there is a point of inflection there definitely because the gradient is the grade 
the gradient isn't even increasing at that point so you know that it's completely flat but the problem is we don't really know whether it's a point of inflection or a stationary point of inflection that's why we have to kind of look back at f of x to be sure okay so in terms of concavity um we find that out using the second derivative because remember that's what tells us whether the gradient is increasing or decreasing and that's what concavity is right so when it's concaving up the gradient is increasing and when it's concaving down the gradient is increasingly negative or otherwise known as decreasing so if we look at here right it's concaving concaving up and then concaving down so you can kind of see where it's going from there and the thing is that it's not always corresponding to like so this one right for example here right this part is concaving down the reason why it's concaving down even though it looks like it's positive is because the gradient is pot like is higher here in terms of positive numbers than it is, is up here so even though this is all positive it's decreasing in terms of its actual gradient right because it goes from let's say positive 20 to positive 5 and the same thing here even though it looks like there is a change of gradient across there which there is but in here it's actually concaving up because it's increasingly getting positive because it was really negative before and it's increasingly getting positive over that slope so in terms of the second derivative concave up is smile um, as the gr increasing gradient as x increases negative gradient concave down decreasing gradient as x increases so it's really easy to get tricked by saying oh the gradient looks positive or the gradient looks negative but just think of what so what the gradient is at the start and then what is actually happening to gradient as it goes along okay so when we do the second derivative test what we use that is to tell whether we have a minimum maximum point of inflection or stationary point of inflection and what we actually do is we want to test the nature um, by the stationary point by just subbing it in you essentially just find what the second derivative is and then sub it in so if it's positive it's a local min and that's because we know that it would be increasing right the gradient is increasing over that position so that means that it's a concave up position so it's gradually gradually it's from something that's negative becoming more and more and more and more and more positive so it's a local min if it's negative it's a local max because it's going from something which is something which is really positive right becoming less and less less positive eventually gets to zero becomes even less positive and becomes eventually negative so if f of x equals to zero we need to find out whether it's a point of inflection or a stationary point of inflection right so we can just sub it into the first derivative again to find it out if f dash of x also equal to zero then it's a stationary point of inflection if it doesn't equal zero then it's just a point of inflection so if you really want to talk about point of inflections you can talk about how it changes signs like either side of the point of inflection so because essentially in terms of a point of inflection right you're going from something which is positive right so you're going positive positive really positive so it's going something oh sorry really ne it's it's the secondary derivative is becoming negative right because we came from something which was really really positive 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 became less positive and then it moves up here becomes n like negative or zero here and then it doesn't become negative sorry it just becomes zero here like the, the but the like the actual second derivative might be it would be negative here because it's becoming less and less positive here right so this the actual section here is less and less positive so therefore it's negative so the second derivative is negative here and then once it gets to here right it starts from something which is just a zero and then becomes more and more positive so we'll have f dash dash x is bigger than zero and that fully shows that you actually have a point of inflection there okay amazing so then let's just talk about how um we have the second and first derivative kind of interacting with each other so essentially in terms of first and second derivative what we have is the relationship evidently between the two is that we have f dash dash x 
is when we do d of dx and we can also talk about the other way around is to the integration of that so whatever it is dx the what each of these kind of mean is so this will tell you the point this will tell you the gradient and this one will tell you the gradient of the gradient so an important thing is that if you're looking for stationary points in that one and you go to the second derivative, it won't tell you the nature of the stationary points in the derivative, right? You actually need to go one step further to find the third, <laughs> third derivative after that. All right, so let's kind of just go through how they interact with each other now um, here. So essentially the position of each thing should be, you know, the same. So let's draw out a table to talk about what's going on here so let's draw out our table so this is our f dash dash of x and this is our f of x so we can draw out our table to kind of talk about what's going on all right so we can say all right let's do f dash dash of x is bigger than zero f dash dash x is smaller than zero and f dash dash x is equal to zero. So if we have f of x equaling, then we have f dash of x bigger than zero, f dash of x smaller than zero, f dash of x equaling to zero, right? So in this one, the gradient, so this is positive gradient, negative gradient, no gradient, otherwise known as a stationary point. This one is gradient is increasing, gradient is decreasing, gradient isn't doing anything. Cool. So when we look at this, right, what's happening when the gradient is increasing? So when the gradient, so the, when the points are increasing and the gradient is increasing, what happens is we'll have something which is in a section literally like this, right? So it'll be like that because the gradient will be starting from something which is normal and then it'll be getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? When the gradient is decreasing, and the, when the gradient is smaller than zero and then it become it's so when it starts as something negative and then the gradient is increasing that's when we have our smiley face kind of position um, but I guess we have to note that in between here that's that's where it equals to zero right so we'll just rub out the other side of it but this is like this side is this side of the smiley face and this one is this side of the smiley face so let me just make sure to rub it out so that we don't get confused So in terms of what's happening, we have, so we have, this one is equaling this side of the smiley face and this one's this side of the smiley face, right? So that's kind of, if we look at like, if we did a gradient along there, we would say that that's what's happening at those points. All right. And then here, this one is just the base of the smiley face. So right here, that's where, that's where we're looking at. So that's why we have, go away. I'm just trying to make this go away so you can see the bottom bar. Normally it goes away when you... Okay, that's all right. Hopefully, hopefully it goes away by itself. If not, we'll look at it in another slide. All right, so that's why when we have this, this kind of like, if we kind of put all of those together, we can kind of see how that forms a turning point type thing. So when it's positive, it's always going to form the local minimum turning point. So we have a smile. So when we have a negative one, so when the gradient is bigger than zero and it was originally positive, that's going to be this arm of the equation, right? Because it's positive, 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 getting less positive. Now this one's going to be this one, right? Because it was negative, started as negative, became even more negative. So this part is going to be this top part here. So it's going to be the frown part of it. All right. So what if f dash dash x is bigger, is equal to zero and f of x is bigger than zero? So what this is actually happening here is what we have is a non-stationary point of inflection. So what that actually means is that we have a point of inflection, right? But instead of something being horizontal, like you can see here, where the gradient isn't changing, it's kind of on an angle. So we can see that the gradient is still changing at 
we can see that the gradient is still positive at that point sorry not changing the gradient is still positive at that point but it's just unchanging right because it's the same slope it's kind of like if we had a line in between that part's like kind of a linear line and the same thing here it's like having this on a slope so you can see that the gradient is still the gradient is still not zero right because it's not flat but we can see that the gradient is negative but it's just becoming so it becomes it goes negative 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 becomes less negative at that point right so this part would be corresponding to here so it started from negative became less and less negative got to a non-stationary point of inflection became stayed at that negativity and then became more negative after that so it kind of moved on to this one so we can see how the sign is changing all right so then if we equal to zero that's when we're going to have our stationary point of inflection like that so we have a flat gradient gradient goes from something which was positive coming becoming negative right so we can see that this one is corresponds to this and then we have this side which corresponds to this so we can see once again the sign is changing across that Ooh, amazing so that's the different interactions. I would recommend to draw this table in your own time as well to kind of have a diagram of what's going on. All right, so let's talk about how we do this. So if f dash of x is bigger than zero and f dash dash of x is, so second derivative is smaller than zero for all of x over a given part of the domain of a function, f, then the graph of the function over this part of the domain would be the curve, which, so what this implies us to us is that the gradient is decreasing and what this applies to us is that the gradient is positive so over this part of the domain the curve would be so because the gradient is positive that means that the curve is increasing right so right away we can say okay the curve is increasing in some manner or form so that means that we can use this answer, this answer, or this answer. And then we know that the gradient is decreasing. So it's going to be great decreasing across this. And the, the increasing x is kind of just, is just used to say that's what's happening as we go from left to right. So we want to say that the gradient is decreasing, but the actual graph itself is increasing, right? Oh, sorry. So f dash of x means strictly increasing, and then double second derivative means concave down. So therefore we would get C here because we can see that the graph in this section would look something like this if we kind of go back to our previous question here. You can kind of see it's going to be this case, right? F dash of x bigger than zero, f dash of x being smaller than zero. Yeah, so you can see gradient is increasing and then gradient, so the curve is increasing and the gradient is decreasing, right? Alright, so in terms of your summary book, what you should have in your summary book is implicit differentiation. If you see a y, differentiate, but just shove dy, dx after. In terms of points of inflection, concavity, that type of thing, we can use that, we can use that to verify turning points like the direction of the gradient. Maybe. Sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of this thing here. So that you can actually see the bottom of the maybe i'll just do this really quickly and then start it again sorry for this just want to make sure you can actually see the bottom part as well cool so in terms of this we can differentiate the y but then shove the dy dx after in terms of points of inflection and concavity we can use that to identify the direction of the turning point slash the direction of the gradient so if it's bigger than zero it's a local min because once again really 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 so it's negative 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 comes to become more zero and then becomes positive over that direction then we have local maxes so positive positive becomes less and less less positive and then eventually becomes negative if it's equal to zero and f dash of x um, if the double derivative is equal to zero and the so it should be the other way around. so if the double derivative why is it not working so if the double derivative is equal to zero right and the gradient is not equal to zero that's a point of inflection if the double derivative is equal to zero and the gradient equals zero then it's a stationary point of inflection 
Okay. In terms of related rates, we can look at the units in the question, make sure to have a look at what they give you and what to use, and just use the chain rule slash parametric equations. So use that equation right there. Okay. So in terms of antiderivative graphs, this is often a really common question in exam two that you might have to explore. And importantly, the main thing to do is just to remember that the x-intercepts will show the stationary points, right? So if you're going from something which is a derivative diff to its original, the x-intercept should show the stationary points. And anything above or the below the gradient shows the direction of the gradient. So you can kind of do a bit of a gradient table using that. So let's go through this question together. It might be a little bit hard to see, but um, essentially it's asking you to, so for the, which of the following could be the, so part of the graph of the derivative of the function above, the function f is shown above. So this is the derivative of the function. Right? And they want which of the following could be the graph of the function. So they want the graph of the function, right? So this is the derivative and they want the graph of the function. All right. So right away, we know that these are going to be special points. Then we can kind of, I just do this. So I go, this is negative, positive, positive, negative, right? So therefore, I know that my, my thing is going to go negative, positive, up, and then back to here. I don't really care what's happening up there. Like it's... It's probably a like one of those non-stationary points of inflection, but I just because if we think of like the double derivative of this, that would be an x-intercept at that point, right? Because it's a special point at that point. So therefore, it would be like some type of wiggly thing happening there. But it would just we just know like we just note that in our equation. Okay, so we're going from positive, and then we become normal and then become negative again so that's the general shape I'm going to be looking for there and that's the shape I want out of that so this shows the derivative which of the following could show the graph of the function so I want a minimum and then a maximum so we can see that this one kind of shows what we need so the graph of this one I think this kind of looks like a non-stationary point of inflection but this doesn't look like a stationary point of inflection so we could be having something, you know, a bit, oh, sorry, this is positive, isn't it? So it actually goes like this instead. Um, so this could be ha something quite interesting happening here. So we want it kind of to go up, and we can see that it's a positive point of inflection there. So it wouldn't be that one, and it wouldn't be that one, and we just ruled out that it wouldn't be that one as well, because I didn't write the correct direction there. But plus positive and positive so therefore this one right this is a non-stationary point of inflection because you can see that the gradient isn't flat there the gradient is only flat in that one so it in fact would be this one instead yeah so this one like the shape of this one would more correspond to what's happening here rather than what's happening here